Egypt pulled out last month in protest at an Israeli proposal to make Jerusalem the official capital. The meeting is expected to take place before the end of the month. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, has appealed to the British Olympic authorities to boycott the Moscow Games. Even, he said, at this late stage, the absence of the Americans has devalued the Games, he added, but the Russians would regard it as a great propaganda victory if many other countries took part. The convicted killer, Robert de Moulpier, who failed to return to Broadmoor last Thursday after a month's parole, has been recaptured. He was recognised and arrested outside Swansea Central Station by Police Constable Gerard Prothero, who was commended by his Chief Inspector for an excellent bit of police work. A 19-year-old youth is to appear in court in Hull tomorrow in connection with a fire last December which killed three young brothers in their home in Hull. Police say Bruce George Peter Lee will be initially charged with murdering one of the brothers. Two Welshmen who burned down an English-owned holiday cottage near Prestatyn have been sent to prison for three years. The court heard that John Speakman, a garage mechanic, and Anthony Thomas Lappin, a fitter, belonged to no political organisation. They'd set fire to the cottage after seeing other house fires on television. An RAF helicopter has rescued one of the sailors in the Observer Transatlantic race from his sinking boat. He's Jacques Tancy from France. He sent a radio message that his yacht was sinking southwest of Cork and about 330 miles from Plymouth, where the race started on Saturday. A Dutch yacht has already been forced out of the single-handed race by steering problems. From Plymouth, Ray Maloney reports on today's rescue. The brief radio message tonight from the Motorola, a monohull like this, said she'd struck wreckage about 170 miles southwest of Cork. All the yachts in the race are equipped with special beacons. Here's one, which transmit positions at regular intervals. They're also designed to send out distress signals in an emergency. And the fact that none were received from the one on the Motorola seems to indicate she went down too fast to get the device into the life raft. The Mayday call, which came from the small radio in the life raft, was actually picked up by another competitor and relayed back. And within less than 10 minutes of receipt, an RAF helicopter was in the air. Meanwhile, an RAF Nimrod on patrol south of Ireland, where it took these shots of yachts earlier today, was directed to the scene and was overhead just over an hour after the Motorola went down. Mr. Timsit was sighted in his life raft in very good weather conditions and was picked up fit and well by the helicopter about two hours ago to be flown to RAF Brody in southwest Wales. Ray Maloney, News at 10, Plymouth. Live television coverage of the European Soccer Championships in Italy is threatened by a strike by Italian TV technicians. Their unions say they've decided to strike during the championships, which start on Wednesday to force Italian television to give better conditions to those working on outside broadcasts. And in the first test match at Trent Bridge, the West Indies are heading for a comfortable win after a day of batting disaster for England. After bowling England out for 252, the West Indies were 109 for two at close of play, needing 99 to win. Mike Nolan reports. The first hour of the morning did belong to England, particularly Boycott, who was edging towards yet another century. <laughs> Bob Woolmer, too, was looking calm and composed until Andy Roberts entered the arena. <laughs> the next man in, David Gower, needed a big innings for both himself and England. He didn't get it. Ian Botham needed a big innings just to save England. He didn't get that either. Not even the lone defender, Jeff Boycott, could stop the rot. And with Boycott gone, went any hopes of victory. Only Peter Willey remained to show that runs could be made off this West Indian pace attack. But it was too late and England surrendered, leaving the West Indies a target of 208. Bob Willis and Alan Knott brought some ray of hope when the battle resumed in the afternoon. Greenwich gone for six. The optimism vanished, however, when Viv Richards arrived. He battered as if he just wanted to get home early. England's back was broken, Richard's job was done. Ah! 
it should be an entertaining day tomorrow for about an hour or so. Mike Nolan, ITN Sport. Rugby, the British Lions, who've been plagued by injury, have called up a record seventh replacement player. Halfway through that controversial South African tour, Paul Dodge, the England centre, has been called in to replace David Richards, who dislocated his shoulder during the Lions' 32-12 win over Transvaal on Saturday. In spite of injuries, that was their best performance so far, and our sports correspondent Ian Edwards was there. Davies checks back inside and links up with Irving. Richards and Hay. Back to Richards. And the first of four tries that were scored in a purple patch of only 16 minutes. The second try by Price came from a high kick by Davies. Richards chases it. Woodward supports. And Price goes over with a professional lack of expression. Professional is not too strong a word to describe the attitude of this touring team, particularly the forwards. Their discipline and control here give Patterson the chance to apply even more pressure. Davies takes advantage of hesitation in defence, touches down and says thank you very much. But in the second half, Patterson, the little Irish leprechaun of a scrum half, who was determined to get his name on the score sheet. And that completed the Lions' most satisfying victory of the tour so far. Ian Edwards, ITN Sport in Johannesburg. And finally, £70 million worth of jewellery went on display at a London club today, modelled by the ladies of the Mountbatten family. The show's in aid of the Mountbatten Trust, a charity set up by Prince Charles after his great-uncle was assassinated. John Suchet. The Marchioness of Milford Haven, niece by marriage to Lord Mountbatten, was the first to receive the treatment from Monsieur Gérard, a jeweller of some repute from Paris. The centrepiece, a 107-carat diamond, cost £5 million. Total worth, adorning the Marchioness, £10 million. For Lady Joanna Natchpool, granddaughter of Lord Mountbatten, an 80-carat sapphire and diamond necklace with matching ring. Total worth one and a quarter million pounds. Oh, tell, tell me, ladies, Joanna, what do you think of these little trifles? Not bad. I don't get to wear these every day of the week. Like them? Yes. Yeah. 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 It makes a good knuckle duster. Emeralds for Lady Romsey, whose husband is heir to the Mountbatten title. These little trifles would fetch two and a half million pounds. How do you like those, Lady Romsey? My goodness, I, if I swing my head, somebody will have to duck. <laughs> Elegant though they are, the Mountbatten's are amateurs. Brigitte from Paris is not. John Suchet, News at 10 in London. That's all from us this evening. We'll be back again with one o'clock news tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs>
with the good colour you'd expect from Kodak. You know right away you've caught that moment.